too. So. Well, so, so right, and actually Ian, Ian was just talking to me. So first of all, I just want to introduce um, someone who I've really just had the privilege of meeting in person this year, Dr. Ian Baker. And I wish I had like read his bio right beforehand because I'm, I'm going to probably just let him tell us more about uh, his background because uh, I, I'm not uh, uh, ready for that to really to do it justice because I know you've written something like Seven, seven books? Seven, 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 books, seven, seven books. books. So I'd like him to talk about that. And we met, uh, many of you know and study uh, with Dr. Nita Chenekseng. And Dr. Nita is a doctor of Soa Rigpa, Tibetan medicine. And I had the great privilege of meeting Ian on a trip to Bhutan this year and got to know him. And he was the first. Uh, one of the scholars, I've met a lot of people through Bob and uh, through my years of looking into to, uh, reality <laughs> through via yoga and meditation. And I haven't come across one yet. It's actually come to yoga every morning, you know, <laughs> and he came. So he was a real practitioner and I'm so happy you're here. So Happy to share Dr. Ian Baker Great. with everybody. And if you don't mind just letting us kind of have a, maybe how you got into the work that you're doing, mm -hmm. your interest in uh, religion and yoga and mm -hmm. philosophy, and would you, if you could just tell us a little bit sure. about yourself and maybe how you ended up writing your first book, because yeah, I'm sure. thinking about mine. Well, good. Excellent. <laughs> good. Well, that's overdue. So. <laughs> Anyway, it's a great privilege to be here. I haven't been to Menla for many years now, and that was, I don't even remember how long ago, but not that long after it had actually opened. And uh, it was for a, a council of the 13 grandmothers. Did you ever hear oh. of this? It was a very unusual wow. conference that was organized. Uh, they were 13 uh, women elders from around the world who were all representing various kind of shamanic traditions. And they were, it was convened here at Menla in order to have them come together from everywhere from the Amazon to Mongolia to wow. talk about how they could unify their vision to um, bring about the transformation in the world that is still required <laughs> and ongoing. Wow. But anyway, I'm so I'm very happy to be here. I also want to really say how Bob Thurman was my mentor when I was at the first PhD program I was in was at Columbia University years ago. And he was, of course, head of the, the Buddhist uh, studies department there and uh, has been a, a great privilege to be connected with him over these many years, even though we haven't seen each other in many years. So I'm very much looking forward yes. to that happening later this afternoon. And then also, uh, it was such a great privilege to learn, you know, all the things I knew about Bob Thurman, but one of the things I really didn't know was this collaboration that he's been doing with, with Michelle on, uh, on Vajra Yoga in bringing together uh, Hatha Yoga and the physical embodied forms of yoga that are so transformational as we all experience that, but with the, the incredible vision and um, visionary practices, if you will, of Vajrayana Buddhism. So bringing together Hatha Yoga and Vajrayana was extremely exciting for me to hear about, and not only to hear about, but to see actually how it was being enacted through the work that you shared with this rather wonderful group of 45 people that we had in Bhutan for this, uh, this fourth Vajrayana Buddhism conference, in which we really opened the conference with demonstrations of various forms of embodied physical yoga in uh, the Tibetan tradition and the Vajrayana tradition as a whole. So of course, Michelle gave a presentation there on Vajra Yoga, but we opened the whole conference with a presentation by Kala Rinpoche uh, on the once secret Niguma yoga tradition. And these were, as may, some of you here may know, was a form of physical yoga connected to the transmission of the six yogas of Niguma. And she's held to have been a sister consort of Naropa, so from the same uh, period of the 11th century. 
And these were the physical practices that were there to, to prepare the physical body as well as the subtle body for these very advanced uh, tantric yogas. So that made for a very exciting conference to begin with that, and then with various other practitioners who were also uh, talking about that link between physical yoga and, and Vajrayana, as we more typically understand it as practices based on visualization and generation of the mandala, dissolution of the mandala, et cetera. So all of this was very exciting for me. It's connected to, uh, Michelle mentioned a number of books I've done. One of the, the, well, the most recent one was a book called Tibetan Yoga Principles and Practices that unfortunately I forgot to bring copies of with me today. And but I think it will have them, we're going to teach on November 3rd in the city, and, mm -hmm. and I think we'll be broadcasting that, but I think we will have that there. And we should, since Ian's starting this course out, I think we should, we just, it's on our book list anyway, but it should just be required reading because it is, it really is fantastic. So let's just do that. And then if you can come to the city on November 3rd, mm -hmm. 7.30 at Tibet House US, you can get it autographed. <laughs> <laughs> right sorry I'll get, your, I'll get your i'll get your feedback but what's exciting uh, for me about that and what that book was about at the time that it came out just a couple of years ago was looking at the the physical yoga that underlies so much of the vajrayana buddhist tradition traditionally and originally and yet which has somehow kind of been kept hidden uh, for a variety of reasons within the monastic traditions of Tibetan Buddhism. And as His Holiness the Dalai Lama had said very directly to me in the context of an earlier book in which, which really first introduced these physical practices, it's called the Dalai Lama's Secret Temple, Tantric Wall Paintings from Tibet. And he said, and I said, well, aren't these, because he encouraged me to write that book. And I said, well, aren't these practices secret? And he said, time of secrecy is over. Mm -hmm. It no longer applies in the world in which we are today. So please, write about it fully. And so that's what I did then. And then when this other book, which was kind of a extension of that, going more deeply into these physical practices, um, I was able to write about them more extensively and in particular to uh, write about them in the context of the six so-called yogas of Naropa, yoga, yogas of six yogas of Niguma, which I'm sure most of you here are aware of, the practices of Tumo or inner fire, the auxiliary practices of partnered sexual yoga, the clear light yogas, the dream yogas, the transference of consciousness, and the navigation of this interim world between one life and another on the one hand, but also through intermediary states that may arise as a result of other practices that we, we do in our lives or experiences that we have in our lives. So the book is really about that. So it's looking at these yogic practice in tantric or tibetan buddhism uh, from this traditional context but the book is trying to look at it also in a comparative light looking at the influences of shaiva tantras on the development of the of the um, yogini tantras in buddhism in ways that haven't really been addressed so much even though there's such clear in mutual influence so this book i hope was to begin a dialogue that looks at how all these practices and traditions are enriched in a comparative perspective. And that's what I find so exciting myself about Vajra Yoga is that it's um, drawing from the rich uh, traditions of, of Vajrayana, but it's also introducing really state-of-the-art uh, physical yoga from your diverse background, whether it's Iyengar or Istanga or you know, in Nejang in the Tibetan tradition and bringing together the, you could say the best practices and innovating in ways that help to support those very core six yogas. So that was very exciting for me in Bhutan to be introduced to that. And um, yeah, we had a wonderful, wonderful trip there for two weeks in the context of the conference. And, and for the conference, you, uh, I, think, I think in 2017, you wrote a paper that was published for the conference that was on uh, a lot of, it, was, it, it seems like it was kind of a preliminary for what I think Vajra, my intention around Vajra Yoga. I think you can find this easily online. I think yeah? it's online. Yeah, and, I think it's. Just, um... And you talk about the, 
the um, in that paper about Hatha Yoga, a little bit maybe even about uh, uh, Krishmacharya potentially, mm -hmm. but and then the Salang Trukors and and I, I found that paper quite fascinating back then. Oh, good, good. So yeah. I think that was also an inspiration. Mm -hmm. So maybe you're one of also the founders of Vajra Yoga. You were putting <laughs> the pieces together was, back then. Putting right? those pieces together for sure. And looking at, in a sense, what was really a lost history of uh, this interface of, of Hatha Yoga and Vajrayana. And that really goes back, as you said, mm -hmm. we see other evidence of that in Krishnamacharya's own life story in which he's said to have actually brought back the, the the sequence of movements of Astanga Yoga from Tibet, you know, from the base of Kailash, from his teacher there. Um, and uh, then also when we really look at how even Vajrayana was really introduced in, in America from 1930s and 40s through this rather extraordinary figure called Theos Bernard, the oh, so-called White Lama. The White Lama, yeah. But he was amazing. Hatha Yoga practitioner who at the same time was deeply inspired by Tibetan Buddhism was really the first to be invited to Tibet and um, and it was he he was also wasn't his uncle around this area, this area. New York yeah Pierre Bernard Pierre you know, sort of and he the Vanderbilts and these New Yorkers and people coming up and practicing with him yeah 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 right and, here in the house he was, he he, didn't he he was an explorer like you in fact you might be an incarnation of him mm -hmm. i mean when i kind of what i know about you and reading about him and what i little but then he disappeared didn't he on a trek or something yes he he's said to have yeah died in a in a clash up in the himalayas uh, east of kashmir near lahul uh that was i think i forget the year 19 i think it was during the whole severance of Pakistan from India. I'd have to check on the years, but it was a very volatile time in India. And he was there collecting Buddhist texts to bring back to the United States. And the whole intention had been to open a, uh, a center of Tibetan Buddhist studies here in the States. But because of his untimely death, mm. none of that actually happened at the time. But then they didn't they find in like a, in his maybe his housekeeper, like in the 1970s or something, they found in her storage facility all of the books mm -hmm. that when he had been there in the, maybe it was what, the 1930s in Tibet, and they sent him off, yeah. almost thinking, do you know the history? Of yeah, there was a mule train, essentially. That of, he was given all of these texts as well as statues to bring back from Tibet to the West, because at that time, Tibet was still a sealed world, but he was seen, at least in his own writings, to be a kind of emissary of Padmasambhava, and uh, with the idea that the Tibetan government saw him as a potential ambassador for Tibetan Buddhism in the West, and as a result, went with this kind of huge mule train full of real treasures from Tibet. That were not looted uh, as it was in the young husband expedition, you know, uh, half a century before that, but actually uh, bequeathed to him with that intention of starting this uh, center that was going to be in California originally. But then, because of his untimely death, all of those treasures ended up in store in a storage unit or a series of storage units. Mm. And because he had no descendants himself, it was left in his will to his his housekeeper, wow. who had no idea what to do with any of this. And then it was a uh, an art dealer uh, in, gosh, when was it? You I mean years later, who sort of came across that and slowly started to acquire some of those objects. And then those were sold off to different museums, different collections. I think the university in Berkeley has a number of them now, yeah. the Crow Museum in Texas. So it's sort of an extraordinary legacy, but it was sort of this great missed opportunity that happened right at the outbreak of the of the second world war because one of the other really interesting things about that is that he was had already been i don't know if any of you here in the room are aware of who gaden chippo chippo was he was an extraordinary mm. yeah tibetan kind of lama intellectual in the 1930s and 40s uh, really brilliant but but definitely not um you know I mean, a, a really eccentric and extraordinary scholar. So um, Theos Bernard was in the process of working out for him to get a visa for America, whereby he would become 
head of this this uh, translation uh, enterprise to translate these texts that had come directly out of Tibet. And then right during that period was the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. So anyone who looked even vaguely Japanese or Oriental, boom, the couldn't get a visa for America. Had that happened, it would have been an extraordinarily interesting history uh, of the introduction, you could say, of Vajrayana Buddhism into America. But instead, it was several decades later when, of course, with Bob Thurman and mm -hmm. uh, the Geshe, you know, the Mongolian Geshe yeah. in New Jersey, that sort of was the uh, induction of Vajrayana into the, the Do you West. think some of those texts that, that he brought that the scriptures that he brought that those were some that Bob ended up translating or working with or that it? I don't know that'd be very interesting to ask um because I heard I heard that there were some things that that uh because of him they what the Chinese destroyed or yeah. took or kept or locked up that this now that that they were saved because of that, but I don't know, you know. Because of those, well, because it'd be very interesting to see, and I, I haven't seen a, you know, kind of a catalog of what those texts are. I've never talked are. to Bob about Theos Bernard, but. Well, we'll have, maybe we'll have yeah, to later this afternoon. I don't know what he would think about him, but yeah, yeah. Okay. interesting. So, but uh, he was, he was a, a, a kind of such a unique character, someone that would go all over there and explore these hidden lands in a sense mm -hmm. and learn the languages and connect mm -hmm. with the people. And this is something that you've been doing. Yeah. It was something that also. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So how, why, how did you end up going, going to, you've been to Tibet? I've been to Tibet a lot, and... but I went to the first to the Himalayas when I was undergraduate in college. And, you know, with the kind of college semester abroad program, we had all the options to go to the usual suspect countries in, mm -hmm. in Europe, and then it was in the 1970s. But then there was suddenly this opportunity to go to Nepal. And so that was incredibly compelling uh, for me. Um, and that was 1977. So I was went to Kathmandu then. And that kind of just, it changed my life dramatically. I met my teacher, Chatra Rinpoche, then. Mm -hmm. I was 19 years old. And um, learned about these you know, hidden land. I mean, I went to Nepal, really the pull, the allure then was less Buddhism than, than the Himalayas. Mm -hmm. But it was sort of the back door into Buddhism was hearing about these. And I went there actually as an art student to study mm -hmm. Tibetan scroll painting because to get credit from my college, Middlebury College in Vermont, I had to do an independent project within my field of study. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll study Tibetan painting, uh, scroll painting. Mm -hmm. And in the context of that, learned about the landscape symbolism the, within the Tibetan uh, painting tradition. So in other words, what was the symbolism of the mountains, the waterfalls, clouds that surrounded whether peaceful, wrathful, or ecstatic deities, and how the landscape as it was depicted echoed, you could say, reverberated the, the qualities that the deity uh, embodied. And so that fascinated me on the one hand, but it also fascinated me to see, you know, these depictions of tunnels leading behind waterfalls into kind of paradisical worlds. Well, she and, took us, I got to go with you behind oh, a little, not a waterfall, well, but, but we, we went behind into a secret little place yeah. on this trip to Bhutan. It was great. Yeah. So, so this whole idea of Bayou um, in yeah. the Tibetan tradition, which are kind of hidden lands or secret lands, which is where this sort of resonance of the landscape comes into kind of dynamic resonance with our own inter inner elements mm -hmm. were you know really captivated my imagination at that time and sort of became a uh, continues to be a, a lifetime you know, Bob quest. Thurman was he was Bob was saying yesterday that he was he was talking about Nalanda and I can't even remember where where how this came up but there was he said made mention of the Tonkas and how really there is nothing from India. Uh, le, le, there must have been mm. Tonkas, mm -hmm. but there isn't even one. Right. That's, yeah. That survived. That survived that. How could they have possibly burnt everything? Yeah. Do you think, or do you think this was something that was picked up later? As an art student, did you look into yeah, that? Yeah, that, that was a very good question. I don't know the answer. You know, with the burning of Nalanda, I mean, we do have evidence of, you know, there's certainly 
not much, but there is Indian scroll painting uh, that predates that period, uh, as well as in Nepal, the Pauba tradition. Mm -hmm. But that's a very good question to look at what uh, Buddhist paintings in India uh, predate the burning of Nalanda. Uh, and certainly there, we know after the predations of the Buddhist monasteries in Tibet that many things were, of course, rescued and buried mm -hmm. and preserved. So it does seem unlikely that nothing survived. Uh, but I don't know the specific dates of that. But of course, it was Tibet where that tradition was resurrected and altered and developed in new ways that were commensurate with, with Tibet's own uh, development of the Vajrayana tradition. So can you explain for, for these uh, students, some of them are very new mm -hmm. to uh, Buddhism and Tibetan Buddhism, but can you just ex explain a little bit more about the Bayul? And also if it, um, so one of the interesting things that happened to me when I, the first time I came to Menla is that in the pool down there, I walked by the first day I was there and there was a black water snake mm. and it was at the bottom of the pool mm -hmm. and there was a woman swimming around and I said, look out for that snake there. And she was like, oh, that's not a snake. And it was really kind of the funny old, you know, is it the snake yeah, or is it the rope? And uh, eventually, and some other people came in eventually, I was like, oh, the poor snake. So I scooped it out with the net and was putting it into the, the little stream. Mm -hmm. And that's when Michael Burbank, the director came by and he said, you have a naga. Mm -hmm. And then that night I came in here and uh, to the conference center for the first time. And he said, that's the woman that found the naga. Mm -hmm. And then Bob came up to me, scurried up and said, do you want to go to the Kala Chakra with me next year? Oh. That was the introduction. Oh. So then it was interesting that when we just went to, uh, we went to India together and we went for this Tibet house trip. And there was a woman who came on the trip that she had, she had never uh, been with our group. She didn't, she was coming from a different background. Her boyfriend just brought her at the last minute, but on the plane coming over, she fell asleep and then she had a dream that she saw very vividly a snake in the bottom of the pool. Mm. And so then she was telling this to Michael Burbank and he said, that's so strange. You know, Michelle Lowe kind of connected with Bob that way. Mm. So then at the end of the trip, or she just wrote to me, and she said on, on the way home, she was reading one of Bob's books and he's talking about how uh, you know, the prophecy, of course, all of the Vajrayana teachings and that someone with the name with the head, the Naga in it, and that this Nagarjuna, mm. you know, eventually was led by the Nagas to the center of, uh, of a water body lake mm -hmm. and received all the teachings from the Nagas. Mm -hmm. So she put it together in her mind that uh, I received then via that little Naga snake the teachings of the Dharma of the in Dharma. the center of the pool. So I'm curious, is that the is the Nagarjuna, are the Bayus connected to um to spirit beings like the Nagas? Mm -hmm. Are they um and is for instance that that um, that tale of Nagarjuna or this mm -hmm. his finding of that it was was that considered a Bayu? Yeah. Well both I think they're very both connected traditions so one could say so the bayu literally means hidden Bayou. land or hidden valley hidden land essentially and these are extraordinary kind of remote realms in the himalayas that are attributed to or that's were first described in texts attributed to padmasambhava who of course is the one who brought tantric buddhism to tibet in the in the eighth century and then I think really from 12th century onward, these texts were revealed by so-called tertin or treasure right. revealers. Uh, and a lot of the texts were actually, although they're attributed to Padmasambhava, they were actually in many cases written down by his consort uh, Yishitsogyal and then hidden away for future generations. And so these treasure texts, which are there are many forms of these treasure texts or terma. Sometimes they're actually ritual objects. Sometimes they're 
ritual texts, sometimes they're meditative meditation manuals, but in other cases, they are actually the hidden lands themselves, mm -hmm. which are supports just like the texts or the ritual objects would be for yogic meditative practice. And so a lot of the texts use very evocative language, poetic language, saying that, you know, just to meditate for one day in a hidden land like these uh, that are blessed and by Padmasambhava is equivalent to a year of meditation elsewhere. So they have this sense of being a very, of literally power places where, um, as one Lama described them, it's like acupuncture points on the body of the earth, where that's where you tap into a whole kind of field of energy that is otherwise um, yeah, harder to access perhaps in our, in our practices. So they're very, they're very powerful, potent places, and they are in some cases very elaborately described as uh, but always described as places very remote and difficult to reach um, mm -hmm. and so before talking more about those the way they connect it say to spirit beings as you refer, refer to them like the nagas like these serpentine energy spirits of nature and of the earth uh, that are also considered the nagas to be guardians uh, of earthly and spiritual treasure so they're called Lu in Tibetan. And I maybe some people may have seen a book called The Dalai Lama's Secret Temple, Tantric Wall Paintings from Tibet. Beautiful. So that was an earlier my coffee table. It's because it's the best yeah. one. So <laughs> this is where the two traditions of let's say Vajra Yoga and, and the, the stories of the Nagas come together. And um and since it also connects to dream, I'll just mention that first and then we'll talk how it connects with Nagarjuna and the, the receiving of the Prajnaparamita sutras from this kind of nether world. But it's it's quite interesting that at the time of the fifth Dalai Lama, when uh, Tibet, as a sense, in its modern sense, was being consolidated in the, the mid to end of the 17th century, the fifth Dalai Lama had a dream that as they built this extraordinary edifice at the Potala Palace, he... Uh, had a visitation from the Lugyalmo, the queen of the Snaga realm, saying, you know, all this construction that you're doing is uh, really disturbing our natural habitat. Because what was happening, they were digging into the earth, this kind of marsh behind the Potala up on this mountain edifice, and it had created a, a lake of sorts. But all of that flooding had disturbed the natural trees and rocks and other things associated with these Nagas. So he made, as a result of this kind of dream vision, uh, a vow to um, build for the Nagas a temple after mm -hmm. the his palace of the Potala was completed. But he he died and passed away before the Potala was mm -hmm. finished. And so it wasn't for 15 more years, during which time his death was hidden in order to allow the completion of the wow. Potala palace, that the Desi Sangi Gyamso, who was the regent for the fifth Dalai Lama, and who was an incredible visionary himself. And he's the one responsible for having created these uh, depictions medical. of the Tibetan medical tantra, wow. uh, tantras that you see on the wall here, also yes. at the end of the 17th That's century. Wow. So in the context, he first did those uh, documenting the Tibetan medical system in a series of uh, whatever, I think 30, 29 or 30 scroll paintings, but then what he did also in this temple, which he created to fulfill the vision of the fifth Dalai Lama, was to create wall paintings that depicted the highest Dzogchen teachings mm -hmm. of the Tibetan Buddhist tradition in the temple that was dedicated to the Nagas, to this so-called Luk, it was called literally the Lukang, mm -hmm. the, the chamber of the serpent spirits. And that connects very definitely, you know, there we go. <laughs> she was brought brought by patty who i said mentioned earlier yeah, yeah. but i don't know what patty i think some of them are getting massages or the first sunny day they're out hiking or something i don't know oh yeah yeah but anyway um yeah this is a naga princess but it's interesting that she has wings though doesn't yeah it? Isn't it? that's i think an unusual this is a nepalese depiction mm -hmm. so the nagas because they're kind of invisible elemental beings they and they can manifest in um anthropomorphic forms as women as male as female as uh almost mermaid like in a certain sense here but with wings is you know quite unusual but it has so i think there's a whole range in which they can be depicted because in a certain sense it's how the human mind interacts with these kind of unconscious forces of 
the psyche and the planet. So uh, tell us more. So she then, so then, so he, he, in the Naga Temple. So the Naga Temple was created, and then the Lu Gyalmo, the uh, she. There's a statue of her at the very at the the ground floor of the Lukong Temple, and people still go there to to uh, seek the blessings of the the wow. Naga Queen, as it were. Her. And then there's Nagarjuna's on the second floor. Okay. And then on the third floor are these extraordinary murals of the uh, the Dzogchen tradition. And nobody had seen it before, uh, besides, I mean, or, or take took photographs. You were the first. I to guess we get... were really the well. Dante Norbu had gone there. Uh, okay. That's where I first saw photographs of it, and okay. they appeared in a book of his called "The Crystal in the Way of Light," just small little black and white images. I'm fascinated. So that was just really after Tibet first opened again in the 1980s. And so when I went there, I went there, I was going every year to Tibet because I lived in Kathmandu. And then I thought, wow, I'll take, let's take pictures of these. This is all before digital photography. So that just meant slides and you didn't really know what you were going to get until you got it back to the state. You couldn't even develop yeah, the slides in Kathmandu. But then uh, because I was seeing His Holiness Dalai Lama every year then, twice a year, because I was running a college semester abroad program in Nepal, and so I had them developed and then made a series of prints of them, large size prints. And then I offered them to his holiness. Uh, and he's like, wow, you know, always had heard about these murals, but he'd never seen images of them himself wow. until I'd offered those to him. And then That's he so got very crazy. excited about that. And he said, yeah, these are all of the, uh, you know, the Dzogchen teachings according to the revealed treasures of Pema Lingpa, who was one of the great 15th century treasure revealers from Bhutan, interestingly. And uh, he said, please make a book about them. <laughs> and I said, oh, aren't they secret teachings, etc.? And that's when he said, no, yeah. time of secrecy is over. And then he told me all the people I needed to go to to get key wow. information about it and was, you know, extremely supportive and wrote the introduction to the book. So that was kind of a way in which these Nagas were the preservers of uh, treasure and the treasure being treasure here. Revealer. What's that? <laughs> the, you're a treasure uh, revealer. Oh. You know? Well, this sense it was, uh, yeah, it was connected yeah. to all of that for sure. Amazing. And uh, yeah, and then that led, as I said, to the, the further book. But all of this really does go right back to Nagarjuna, who was one of the great uh, you know, Buddhist philosophers um teachers who was said to have gone down into this realm of the nagas in order to where the nagas who had preserved the prajnaparamita sutras the perfection of wisdom sutras the at the core of which is this very famous heart sutra which is the essence of the wisdom contained within the perfection of wisdom sutras which is the core very condensed sutra which is also preserved at the heart of even the zen buddhist tradition in which is the full uh implications of shunyata or of emptiness is revealed and shunyata we often say is emptiness but it's really it as as you're well aware it's it's a word that's so difficult to translate effectively because shunyata is not shunya which would be empty but shunyata, it's kind of the efflorescence. It's the whole manifestation of emptiness. And therefore, we're looking at the infinite, you know, what David Bohm, who was, of course, the, mm. as the Dalai Lama refers to as his physics teacher, he calls it infinite potential. So in David Bohm's own iteration of shunyata is the infinite potential at the heart mm. of reality that is continually unfolding. And that's really what we're looking into is not some kind of primal abyss of vacuity mm. but just something in which everything emerges from so that's really the vision of the heart sutra and how that that manifestation everything comes from it and dissolves back into it and that was as you were saying a kind of you could say the realm of the nagas is um, a hidden dimension of the earth and mm. of the psyche mm -hmm. and that's what fascinated me about these hidden lands is that they were places that we could say are kind of intermediary dimensions between physical reality and spiritual reality uh, in the same way that we have the myths of Shambhala, you know, is Shambhala of the earth or is it connected to the earth or is it something that we can only travel to in meditation and imagination?
Mm -hmm. But what I found fascinating about the hidden lands is that they were actually on the earth and you could actually get to them. So didn't have to wait till you died or until you were a great uh, meditator to be able to, to get to them, but you could with great. And how many have you been to? I've been of the, the and they're different uh, iter enumerations of the hidden lands, sometimes 108, sometimes mm -hmm. 18, 24. But I've been to probably you know, five of the, the core and ones. And they were, I remember when you were, you were presenting at the Vajrayana conference Sundays and you showed like, and there, or I had a dream about it, <laughs> but, uh -huh. that, and the, but I think you were trying to get you to quite, you had to go up like huge snowy mountain passes and then getting behind and around to, was that? Didn't yeah, you that was all, all part of it. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. And then you finally couldn't get across, like the, there was some water, I think a water body or rushing river yeah. or something. Eventually you, you, you guys couldn't get across that. Right. And, that was for this, what's often held by tradition to be the greatest of these so-called hidden lands is Pemaku or Bayou yeah. Pemaku, which is the hidden land shaped or arrayed like lotuses um, in Southeastern Tibet. And, that's considered to be a kind of a terrestrial or earthly manifestation of uh, Dorji Pamo or Vajavarahi, a form mm -hmm. of Vajrayogini, uh, embedded uh, within the landscape. And um, so when you go on pilgrimage and travel into that land, you're actually going down into the... Is it you? Yeah, that's me. Oh, okay, it's you're, mine. You're, you're, I was you're, thinking it was maybe no, might I, be mine over there. I so to turn it off. Yeah. Uh, sorry, to... sorry. No, no, it's all good. <laughs> Uh, so what's sort of wonderful about that um, depiction of the, um, the hidden lands of, of Pemaku is that uh, as you move through the landscape, you're moving through on one level, the anatomy of a tantric goddess yeah. who is, kept, of course, at the same time, inseparable from your own subtle body. Yeah. So you're starting from the head, you're moving through the throat. So all kinds of experiences that you have within, while traveling through the landscape, you could say are happening energetically uh, through this merging of your own five, ele five elements or six elements, mm -hmm. even as it's described with the elements of the landscape. So the earth, water, fire, air, and all of their subtle mm -hmm. dimensions are, are uh, moving you into a direct experience because it's all within the Dzogchen tradition mm -hmm. of a, a kind of non -du, non duality of outer, inner, and uh, self and other landscape and body. So subtle, sacred geography and sacred anatomy, really. So all of that becomes rather intoxicating as you enter into these lands with the, you could say, the, the core. Uh, meditative prescription for traveling through the hidden lands is is danang, which is in Tibetan means pure vision, mm. which really is the for those of you familiar with some of the Tibetan Buddhist practices, they kind of begin and end with this mm. evocation of the deity and of the mandala out of this primordial potentiality that we sometimes call emptiness, mm. or even as you know as Bob Thurman sometimes calls relative you know great relativity. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then it dissolves back into that primordial ground at the end. Uh, mm -hmm. But out of that, you then have the dedication at the end in which you kind of vow to have this pure vision in which all, all sights or all beings or dakas and bikinis and everything that you see in this world is a manifestation of the mandala and all sounds or mantra. So this is something you really, as you enter into these hidden lands, which are often very very difficult and full of yeah a lot of hardships <laughs> mm -hmm. but the point is to have this kind of pure vision where you take that as the challenge to actually have a pure vision of that environment as a mandala and as the body of the goddess and that brings about a transformation of your experience and then that just kind of continues to to accelerate in a way so that's what i found to be uh, sort of the practice, if you will, of the hidden land is to recognize the hidden land is really just an outer geographical uh, expression of our own Buddha nature. And so, while you while you were still alive in this in this embodiment, you entered into the womb of her, like in Poa, where we shoot off into 
the mm -hmm. dakinis open womb yeah into our vag vagina right we just like shoot have you seen those beautiful images yeah like a super city where you're just moving right up into and the so, celestial so in a worlds. certain sense like you did it already on the planet here yeah in a way this know, is like a reverse because rather yeah, than reverse. is ultimately as we know a practice that you know you kind of ultimately do at the end of your when you feel that this this body no longer serves yeah. and you tr are ready to exit it you know into a buddha field um but here we have a terrestrial Buddha field yeah. that's depicted as so uh, rather than into the womb of space, uh, you're actually moving into the womb yes. of earth. Yes. And even where some of the, they call the young sung Pemaku, the young sung Beu, the innermost secret Beu is like actually under the earth. So you're actually moving in another direction where you're becoming more and more terrestrialized, you're becoming more and more embodied. And that's what fascinated me about it. It's not this kind of se separation of the body and spirit but a deep mm. kind of spiritualization of nature or a um yeah where that that sense of separation that sometimes we mm -hmm. hold even subtly uh to our detriment where we split off you know the physical and the spiritual come into kind of a radical conjunction and the, the, i think you know when i had this in in 2014 after doing that kala chakra after that like my husband didn't even recognize in me anymore because I just, I spent like three years in the forest. Mm. I just went out like living in the forest, walking. I mean, like it was a crazy thing. I'm such a city girl. Mm -hmm. And then I had to walk in the forest and be in the forest and mm. eat the plants and drink, you know, it was the, the most incredible thing. Like I was being called out mm. there. Mm. Um, and I think it, it is this merging sort of that happens you can go both way you can maybe end ways you can enter it through the through nature or if you enter it as i did through the mandala of the kala chakra yeah. then it just started started to also take me into what was natural mm. which is the the lands the yeah. forest yeah because that wheel of time was yeah. everywhere in a sense yeah. through nature's narrative which is essentially the wheel of yeah. time and yeah so did, do you feel example. then that that's that that um when did you feel those sorts of hits when you went in there like then did you does the land keep calling you back and well it did i mean pamica in particular i mean i did several long retreats in other hidden lands there's one called bayu yomo the hidden land inscribed by snow mountains in nepal which is where my teacher chat rimbashe had first uh sent me uh to do to do a month-long retreat and mm -hmm. um which was sort of a story in itself. But then when it became possible to go to the so-called greatest of the hidden lands, Pemaku, then uh, the experiences that I had there were just, to me, so outside of my normal range of experience that it was, you know, the, as soon as I left, it was like, okay, how am I going to go back? It was just a deepening yeah. of the experiences that had begun to reveal themselves while there. And... Um, also, because we were moving from the upper part of the body of the goddess, from the head to the heart center, to the to the to the navel, to the womb, and so these successive trips were successive entry into then the womb part of of Vajravahi being associated with so-called the innermost secret mm -hmm. Pemaku, Yangsang Pemaku, which is a place where this kind of experience of non-duality. Um, which it would be described in the in the Dzogchen path, if you will, uh, is something that's mirrored within the pilgrimage process of mm -hmm. moving through that particular landscape. So it was definitely something that called me back to year after year. Pretty amazing, right? Um, anyway, it was, it was all fun. <laughs> so... This trip I had with him, I'm going to take a question in a second for Ian, but this trip that we went to in Bhutan, this guy, there was like the, there were a few groups that kind of every time we were going to go hiking and the advanced, the basically the crazy ones went with Ian because it was like, and Dr. Nita would say, no, that's too slippery. Those rocks are too slippery. Or the guides would say, no, you can't go that way. The The, the water is taken out the, and then, no oh that's the best part <laughs> so the, the group 
groups that would follow Ian and to the so anyway I'm just saying he's he's doing a lot of uh, some trips next year as well back to Bhutan and and if you have uh, this adventurous spirit and want to go in mm. to uh, explore these yeah. go with him uh, well we'll see well, Dr. Need and I will do another trip in Bhutan in November <laughs> and we're hoping to lure yeah. that in any case there'll be other so. grand you know after just after you left because I kind of told him no <laughs> <laughs> and then after he left I was like wait a second I really want to go mm. with him and then and then I started thinking about the week you know that I was telling you with the yogini week that maybe we could do that and then the, for the people that wanted to stay, stay and on, integrate yeah. and yeah. we just go and do that so then that's that's where I was working with that so well, maybe yeah. more things will yeah, manifest I think so. here, no doubt I but, think so. but yeah it's oh they'll come right <laughs> <laughs> Good. but this is all vajra yoga because of yeah. course what are we talking about when yoga it's about you know connecting and yes. uh, merging a great connection and then the vajra is that you know it's the ultimate path and so this was all the yoga pilgrimage you know how do we mm -hmm. how do we work move within not just move within our bodies on in the yoga studio but how do we move across the earth how do mm -hmm. we move within landscapes how do we move within so-called power places and sacred landscapes in order to bring about those same kinds of internal transformations that we seek in mm -hmm. the actual sequences of what you know, the Vajra yoga mm -hmm. tradition or the Nejang tradition or the many forms that have now, you know, so excitingly being merged together into to new sequences mm -hmm. that are looking at, you know, what you introduced, I think, was in Bhutan, just, you know, really, in some ways, I think what you're all experiencing, well, at least with Ice Man, was revolutionary. But they're, they're, they're not quite getting that yet. I've made them do the, like, a strongest standing sequence today. Uh, because what we're doing in this, I have, I get nine months or yeah, ten months or something yeah. with them. So what we're doing is we're learning, like, Nejong separately. We've been doing all week Nejong practice. If you come in the morning, we'll do the 24 sequence of uh, Nejong. And then we're kind of separately building and really understanding them and then of course then they'll they'll see how they merge together oh, and the sequences won't be too long before we'll do i'll, I'll share more yeah, yeah. of that with them. but astanga what yeah. a you know it's it's yeah. such a powerful foundation <laughs> for all yeah. of this other uh work to emerge from and well, the found and foundations are important and that's another aspect of um you know what bob talked to you all yesterday about the ethical side and mm. so much of what we're trying to do as well with Vajra Yoga is, you know, teach these, give them the really solid ground and respect for, mm. um, yeah, their own, you know, to, to tap into their clear light nature in a way that then they see that in everyone else and then they respect them yep, deeply. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So, but I think that's it to have the foundations is really good. Yep. And the foundation and ethics as well. Definitely. So, have you had have you you know the yoga world i mean you've been around the kind of the yoga world for a long time and you've lived in places like yeah Kathmandu, all of mm -hmm. it have you when when it comes to tantra mm -hmm. um and hatha yoga when i first started going to india like 30 years ago you could i I, found, I learned pretty quickly to just not tell them that i was there to, to doing yoga because or i was a yogini mm -hmm. because they just looked at me like i was insane mm -hmm. and that that uh, they because they kind of threw tantra out mm -hmm. you know it was um, too much abuses mm -hmm. and sexual abuses and all the rest so what was your experience with that or um ethical unethical behavior and what do you think for for our school you know is important to kind of mm -hmm. remember yeah, um, yeah, no, a very important question. I mean, I went into Kathmandu in the seventies, and it was a, it was a different era. It was a different time, a different world, and it wasn't. And then, as I said, my I had I met Dujar Rinpoche and then Chatur Rinpoche, mm -hmm. and so I was sort of in a school or a tradition that, um, for me. I mean, I didn't really think about ethics or one way or the other because it really wasn't it wasn't an operative concern. 
because you and you felt you felt safe and they were there the way they presented themselves and everything yeah, else never, and their students yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it was interesting because i've reflected on that sometimes when we think about you know so many of the abuses that have yes. happened within the tibetan buddhist world come through a let's say misapplication on our end or a misunderstanding of or a misuse of the the guru mm -hmm. disciple relationship let's say yes. you know, with this idea that people can have oh once you've you know been initiated into this tradition and then you're obligated to to do whatever you know the guru tells you to do even mm -hmm. if it goes against your own you know innate mm -hmm. understanding and instincts and uh and intuition and that's deeply problematic i think um i mean in a way i guess that where that related to me in my experience, let's say with Chatra Rinpoche, who, you know, I think once he realized that, I mean, I came to, to Nepal and to Buddhism with a background in, in mountaineering, ice climbing and rock climbing. So I, I liked extreme situations that were very dangerous. <laughs> so the idea that when I first heard of the hidden lands, for example, that, oh, they're very difficult. You shouldn't think about it. You, can, you might get hurt. Just, come on. <laughs> the harder, the better. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so the fact that, well, I'll just tell this story because it does connect. Yeah. So when I, good. I, I'd, met, I'd known Chatra, I met him first, you know, when I'd first gone to Nepal, when I went back to and started living there from 1984 and this tradition of hidden lands had really just fired my imagination when I'd first heard of it several years earlier. So I went back to him in 1984 and just asked him to, if he could really explain what is the real principle behind the Beu, behind the hidden lands. And just looked at me for a moment quite intensely. He had a very intense countenance. He said, can you spend the month alone? I said, yeah, of course, if I needed to, if that was called for. And, and he said, okay, come back and come up to Yomo, where he was, which is like at that time a three-day walk north of Kathmandu in the mountains when you have a month when you're free, and then I will send you to a hidden land, to a bayul, and then you won't have to, and then when you come back, you will know what a bayul is. You won't have to ask me anymore. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, well, that was quite a challenge. So I uh, went that next summer up there. I said, oh, so you've come. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then he sent me off to a cave um, in, it was like a two-day, no, that time was just one day walk away from where his encampment was called Nading up in Yomo and I spent my month there and that in itself was a quite a, a long story because what happened during you know internally for me during that month was mm -hmm. very very intense many extraordinary signs that you had the signs really things I had never seen before are they happening internally externally there were many many mm -hmm. things that were so powerful that even when the month ended and I'd run out of food I didn't want to go down Mm -hmm. So I stayed for uh, right. I had a, I stayed for an extra week living on limes and spirulina, which I, <laughs> which I had, and then kind of floated down at the end of that. And and he said, and I sort of explained. I said, well, at first, you know, well, and I said, so I stayed this extra week. He was very high. He said, yeah, one of my senior monks. I sent that that same cave you were. He stayed three days and he came down. He said it was too scary. Mm -hmm. So after that, I was in. <laughs> you know, then then I realized, you know, I guess he realized he could send me sort of anywhere so the next summer sent me to another further cave uh up in the same hidden land of yomo and then when i was leading literally he handed me the the bag of the ground sampa and i was just one-on-one -on -one wow. with him in his hut and i said you know did and he was telling about the cave i would go to i said did gurumbashe you know pamas mava really stay in the cave that now you're sending me to and he looked at me you know like a total idiot that i was and said where didn't Guru Rinpoche stay? <laughs> and then, as he always taught, interestingly, sort of in three steps, it was sort of like a Zen master. He said, I think the only place that Guru Rinpoche never went was America. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, yeah, that was the second point. And then the third was, you know, Guru Rinpoche is here in your mm. heart or he's nowhere. And if you don't find the guru here, then mm. yeah, you'll never find him. Now go. Mm. So that was their final uh, right. message. To, and before I went off then for this other this time a six-week retreat in this kind of remote cave in a kind of deeper part of a uh, hidden land within a hidden land within Yomo. Mm -hmm. So the point there was really that, um, you know, these places had their, 
you know, mm. you could say on another level, since we're talking about, you know, relationships with teachers, I, you know, the, the, the harder the quest he gave me, the more excited I was, you know, mm. but, you know, in another, in a weird, perverse way, because, oh, they sent you to some remote place. And what happens if you suddenly got sick and, mm -hmm. you know, you didn't have, that was before phones and what happened, you know, that what if there was a medical emergency? And I mean, you could do all the, all kinds of head trips to make it sound different yeah. than, than it was. Yeah. And the trouble is that it's always so subtle how we experience when we're pushed mm -hmm. beyond our, our limits and we're pushed beyond our boundaries. And that was the whole point yeah. in Vajrayana Buddhism. If we look at the early stories, if we look at Padmasambhava and his relationship with Yeshit Sogyal, me too, all over the place, mm -hmm. you know, abusive and all kinds of things. But that wasn't ultimately the experience. Mm -hmm. So it's how we frame extreme yeah. experiences, whether is it traumatic or is it hormetic you know is it you stress in which we are pushed beyond our limits so that we grow mm -hmm. and transform in ways that we aren't capable of if we stay within our comfort zones so it's a really subtle thing i think in vajrayana yeah. when to be pushed when not to push and the problem i think now that i've seen is so much when people feel that they've taken initiations from teachers who have you know it's over zoom across the world mm -hmm. they've never met them and then they think they're under some kind of sorry kind guys of I'm sorry. <laughs> duress <laughs> exactly and then all kinds of problems result you know from that um yeah sometimes and i think this is where it's, it's well, tricky no it's how true we under, how we understand and even we assume it's the relationship you know it's it, it is the relationship when you said you know in the heart when he said that about in, 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 you know padmasambhav in the heart and i found over the years with having a studio yoga studio you know all of those years i never had a problem with students mm -hmm. and i i i gave assists all the time hands on assist every single student mm -hmm. i'd really have my hands all over them to mm -hmm. help them guide the breath to, and there was a trust there was a relationship sure. and there was never this feeling like that you know yeah i just didn't have any trouble but certainly it is now um so many people are really afraid mm -hmm. to, um, you know, to touch their students or, mm -hmm. um, but I think that if you build that relationship first, and then the T and then also then that you had that deep relationship with him, you went back, you trusted him, mm -hmm. and that you knew now he was, I, as you were talking about, then he was giving you another difficult one, I kept thinking about him, like, talking to his buddies going, yeah, yeah, baker's back we're sending him to even harder one <laughs> no, you know? but i'm just teasing no, that was my you know. no i'm sure he just of course knew exactly what the perfect place for you yeah. was and because you had relationship and and you loved each other mm. and this is the thing is it's the love isn't it yeah and that trust and that, that's the thing when there is that trust and there is that that sense of um yeah that you're yeah. in this together and that really is what the relationship yeah. with the teacher within the tantra tradition had to have been and for mm -hmm. it to be and for the transgression that was productive to yes. occur so if we look at that even before tibet we look at vajrayana mm -hmm. in india let's say when it first emerged in sixth seventh eighth century up to the 12th century and we look at the parallel traditions of shaiva tantra Mm -hmm. and the kula tradition or the kaula mm -hmm. tradition which yeah. also yeah. is kula which was meant family it was a clan and all the whole way that tantric initiation occurred and there's so many parallels between the tantric and the hindu or the mm -hmm. buddhist and the hindu mm -hmm. all that what it was about was a kind of complete and radical um transgression of what was a caste-based uh social structure at that time in order to liberate yourself from mm -hmm. constraining social structures in the safety net of an incredibly intense uh, family structure you could say mm -hmm. and so the deep trust that developed between the teacher the student and you were living then in a in a i mean kula literally mm -hmm. was family mm -hmm. and so that was also my experience within you know the kaula tradition mm -hmm. in india with teacher kaula teacher that i had there you were suddenly in a radical circumstances sometimes that if you were not within that initiatic mm -hmm. bond could be seen as deeply problematic mm -hmm. and that had to only that could only arise once there was that deep trust and deep 
mutual recognition mm -hmm. between the teacher and the students. And as we know, sometimes that doesn't always work. Mm -hmm. And then there can be a lot of, there can be the confusion and things mm -hmm. that arise. So I think it's a really critical issue in today's world, you know, exactly as you're doing to establish what the ethical and, and moral Mm -hmm. bounds are of a tradition that has its origins in you could say progressive transgression in other words how do we have a tradition that's all based upon pushing beyond our comfort zones mm -hmm. and beyond our normal sense of even societal limits um in ways that are not in any way remotely harmful but mm -hmm. actually liberating and that's so subtle it's subtle and even like uh, today, Yogini said, "You you had me do Ashtanga. I don't. I've, it's always been triggering for me, or always been difficult, right? How did you say? And then you said it cracked you open. I did. I said I've never. There are traditions poses that I never get into. Things that I give up in a normal class, but in this kind of space, and you called it a wonderful teacher, and she got me into those poses and." I pushed when I didn't want to push anymore because yeah. you're supposed to be doing the teacher training and you don't give up and you yeah. do yeah. it. And after an hour and a half, I just started to cry. It was like five years of therapy. All yeah. yeah, and that's yeah, that's that's yeah. great. So yeah, so so yeah, sometimes, cool. but you know, then we have to be very careful too, you know, because yeah. it could have then yeah, and maybe we're ready for that. That. Well, that's um, Okay, there. Do you mind taking some questions? No, of course not. Sure. Maybe. So we need the mic to go. Oh, you got it. Okay, fantastic. I'm ready. Can you hear me? Yeah, really. Yeah. Get really close to Hello? it so the people at home can hear. Hello. Yes. Ah, there we are. Okay. Ah, I, I've got a um, series of four questions, and three <laughs> of them tie together. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, number one. Have you experienced any hidden lands outside of the Himalayas? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's a very important question. Um, so if we think of Bayou more as a phenomena rather than as a set of uh, textually based places described in Tibetan texts, that was a question. It wasn't even a question. It actually came up very early on when I was first researching hidden lands, and I was actually in Dharamsala at that time, was when I first met Namkai Nobu Rinpoche and was talking to him about Beyu. This would have been back in the 1980s, actually. Yeah. And he said, don't think of Beyu as being limited to those in the texts or into the Himalayas. There are Beyu everywhere. And so part of what he'd been exploring in his own life was was in Venezuela. There was an island off of um, off of Venezuela, at the different places where he had established um, branches, if you will, of the what was then just called the Zolchen community. And Nankanorbu was very connected and very interested in this idea of sacred uh, landscape and sacred geography. So he said, yeah, they're Beul in South America. They're Beul that he, it's about tapping into some kind of dimension of nature that of course is infused within nature. It's a kind of holographic universe. So mm -hmm. everything is everywhere. And where are those places where we can tap into that? Sometimes the texts of the traditional Beul are such that they inspire us to enter into a particular landscape and with that danang, that pure vision, so that we can enter into, you could say, the practice of a hidden land uh, more powerfully. But another thing that he said to me at that time, very early on, was also to understand that bayu sometimes have lifespans. Mm. So what might be a bayu at a certain period of time in history may seek, cease to be so because of changing circumstances. And that was very interesting to me. So I think he, he cited like Sikkim, for example, which uh, was a Himalayan Buddhist kingdom that, that became annexed by, by India and now a state of India. But in its earlier um, period, it was a hidden land called Dremajong, described in early Tibetan texts, the hidden land of rice. 
And this Latsum Jigne, who went there, and there's a whole incredible story of the opening of that hidden land. And it served a certain function at that time where followers of the Nyingma tradition were able to settle there. It became a sanctuary for, uh, for tantric Buddhist practice and continued to be so. But then, according to Namkai Norbu, he said, you know, then it served its function and didn't have the same potency uh, mm -hmm. that it might have had, sort of its, its power sort of waned over time. And one could argue that there are other hidden lands like that, whether there, there are several hidden lands in, in Bhutan, there's this Pemaku in Tibet that's now also been altered by, the vir by virtue of the Chinese putting in, trying to put in a hydroelectric power plant in it or put roads mm -hmm. down into what would be the navel of the hidden land. So one has to think about, and do they then relocate? And that's connected, I think, you know, to other forms of of other teachers that I've had, even outside of the the tantric Buddhist tradition, but in who have recognized that certain temples like Borobudur that had a kind of guardian spirit force over them. Mm -hmm. This was this Magus of Java, John Chang, who I studied with quite extensively, who was of a Taoist lineage. He said, "Well, the the deity of Borobudur is gone." now so mm -hmm. now and i said well where he said no it's now this mountain forget the name mm -hmm. of it in java so actually as a power place you need to go to this mountain not to the temple mm -hmm. and that was because in his own way in practice he was directly in touch with those elemental forces that uh so wow. if you're trying to tap into that then just going to the, the temple is kind of empty now so that was fascinating to me and, uh, and and also I wonder how much is connected to like astrology or, or the the shifting of the planets and stars you know to connect to like how much above is because above and yeah, yeah. below and you know these kinds of transits long term I don't know you know like a portal opens from above or something is I don't know no it's something like that and I think there are people that aren't recognized specifically as yeah. as people that I mean i even on Mount Whitney in California, just sort of tapped mm. into a dimension of that that extraordinary mountain, mm -hmm. uh, a valley there that just had, to me, all of that resonance that that um, that Bay will have, where somehow mm -hmm. the configuration of rock, water, earth was acting on me in particular ways, and many other mm -hmm. qualities that are described as a Bay they're all meant to have. Decide these features; they have medicinal plants. They've even According mm -hmm. to some of the texts, they all have to have a psychoactive plant in them. So mm -hmm. there's another interesting dimension to how hidden lands are understood uh, and the qualities that they have through our interaction with them. So I guess because you had three more, I'll try to answer them quickly and then I'll <laughs> okay. go, go to, to Okay, to you, I'll right? do it. Yeah. So um, to go on an expedition with you, um, are you open to other people going? And if so, what prerequisites and how how would we contact you? Okay. So let, can I can you can you ask the two other questions? In, those those were the three. Oh, those are the three. Okay. I threw them all. Okay. 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 So those are together. So yeah. Um, so for Pemaku, uh, for the many years that I was going there yearly. And then I wrote this book called The Heart of the World, was about those uh, successive expeditions into Pemico. I did invite other people to go, and I tried to prevent many other people <laughs> or, or persuade them that they didn't want to go, because the general principle for that was if anybody had any doubt about their capacity, then they shouldn't even think about coming. So we had some rather, ex and so if anybody's read the book, The Heart of the World, you'll see it. There were some extraordinary friend, you know, friends now who who came on. Uh, several of those expeditions uh, that were in some ways rather extreme. And then after finishing the Heart of the World, I was able to go three times into the womb of Vajavarahi Vajagini on what's now the, within, uh, across the border on the north northeast frontiers of India, uh, and brought several people on those three different uh, trips, which were very demanding and uh, challenging, um, and at the same time, extraordinary, the experiences that we had there. Um, and 
I guess since then I've felt that those kind of extreme expeditions, there are, again, the last one of those, for example, was somebody who deeply wanted to go. And so they actually sponsored the trip themselves as a in single individual. So it was just me with them and supported by this Bhutanese uh, medicinal plant. Uh, he was a, a lama and a, a yogi and a, uh, and a Tibet and a traditional practitioner of Solaripa. So it was just the three of us on that trip. And that was extraordinary. So those kind of extreme journeys into those hidden lands kind of take unique um, qualities, let's say were private expeditions in the end. Uh, Bhutan, for example, which as a whole is sometimes considered a hidden land, uh, but within it has mm -hmm. hidden lands like Kembajung, uh, which is a place that um, has been sealed for the last few years because can, that hidden land is connected to the life force of the royal family, interestingly. Mm -hmm. uh, so some a whole other aspect. But then, you know, this hidden land that Michelle was describing called mm -hmm. Chumpukne, which is considered Sari Nipa, means the second Sari, which is a hidden land in Tibet connected to the Chakrasambhara Tantra. This is a kind of microcosmic uh, version of that. And so going there, you're kind of tapping into a larger field. And so those are so the trips in Bhutan that I do definitely tap into this whole hidden land uh, mythos and, and experience. And so, for example, the one that Dr. Nita and I will do in this coming November, which mm -hmm. Michelle may come, <laughs> and all of you would be invited to do, we're going to be f focused in central Bhutan and the Bumtong Valley, and particularly to a place called Kandraling, which is a hidden land connected to the Dakinis. And so oh, our man. program there <laughs> is going to be to start out at this incredible manor house, the Oregon Chilling Manor, but then to go this up and set up, a, set up a camp <laughs> in this hidden valley of the Dakinis and do that's where the you know the main that was my retreat. idea. Nita just took my no, I'm just but, joking. No, he's not. The Dakinis no, no. get around. No, no, no. Yeah, they, they do. Have hidden I, was, I was wondering about this though, about this. How many women mm -hmm. go have gone on these with you? Or are they because they already are Vajra Yogini? Oh, yeah. <laughs> they, do they do they need to go a little bit less, do you think? Or is it Less. I mean, do they go to uh, with you to the to these uh, yeah, not not to these ones, but to those other big bayou? Big bayou. I've had definitely had women. You had women. Oh, absolutely. Okay. And they've had amazing, you know, life changing experiences. From okay, that. fantastic. I guess the difference is, you know, what I always find is a really interesting thing. One lama said to me about the inner completion state practices of Vajrayana Buddhism. And we see that even in texts where Padmasambhava is said to have said that, you know, the body of a woman is actually more conducive mm -hmm. to these practices than men are. Mm -hmm. And I remember asking one lama, I said, well, why is that? He said, well, because women have wombs and mm -hmm. men just have womb envy. And mm -hmm. all of these elaborate practices which uh, are involved is about men trying to generate a womb, uh, whereas women are just naturally endowed and they don't actually have to do the same complex practices that men have to do. And I said, well, that's not really articulated in the text. He said, no, but that's the oral tradition. Yeah. So I thought this was something really fascinating. <laughs> yeah, and we know that this is yeah. the truth. But, the truth, but, but anyway, so. You'll exactly. find me at the spa when he's up there. No, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just joking. I want to go too. Yeah. I want to go too. I, lo I loved it. Yeah. yeah. And I actually got stronger each time. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Dr. Baker, thank you so much for coming to visit us today. Yeah. And you have some people that want to join you on this trip to the Zikinis. Yeah. Um, I had a different question for you, but when you started talking about, you know, finding hidden lands, other places, um, I thought of my home of Louisville, which I really love Louisville, Kentucky, but I was actually introduced to your work by Baka Tukul Rinpoche, oh. uh, because one of his, uh, sisters lives there and she's married to a doctor there. Her name is Chime. And sorry, to who? To who? uh, Chime Steiner is okay. one of his sisters on, or, you know married to someone but yep. he's who introduced me to your work and he is tied to louisville and uh you know you started talking and i thought we have medicinal plants and caves and all sorts of things so i'd love it if you'd come and visit and we can see if it's a hidden land <laughs> <laughs> well but, i'm uh, sure appalachia has hidden uh oh yes hidden, there's hidden magic places so thank you yeah but that um my original question i actually brought this for michelle and it is a tanka of a Paldin Lamo. 
Oh. And I thought maybe you could tell her a little bit about that one, if you know anything about this one. Well, I don't, I'm not sure I need to tell Michelle anything about, about Calvin Lambo, but <laughs> you know, this is a special one in, in Union. And I thought okay. uh, I'd offer yeah. it. Maybe he can tell us a little okay. about Beautiful. it. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Do you all, do the rest of you know who Peldon Lamo is? And she's uh, very, very special to, well, since Ian's here, he can talk about this, but, but yeah, to the Dalai Lamas, she's the protector yes, of the box. Hold that up. Lamas. A picture. It's tight. Yeah, it, I'm trying to see that. But he can still probably it's a yabium. Yabium. Yeah, I can oh, just, just hold it up, like turn yeah. around. If you turn okay. it in. Ah, yes, here we go. Paul and Lamo Yabium. Yeah, exactly. Turn it, turn it this way. Yeah, so so can everybody can see this. So Paul and Lamo is, is uh, you know, well known in the course of Tibetan Buddhist tradition as this wrathful female uh, protectress riding her horse across the seas of blood, which we can understand kind of as the, you know, the, the oceans of samsara. And so she's the protectress also, particularly with the Galukpa uh, tradition. And there are particular sacred uh, places in Tibet that are particularly connected with Paul and Lamo, like Mosho Lake in East Tibet, where it's considered to be one of the kind of places where Paul and Lamo is particularly active. Um, but she's, um, yeah, is uh, something that's invoked as a, as a protectress, uh, but also very deeply connected with, with the landscape in that sense of Tibet. But this, this which you're introducing me to, is. Uh, a very unique form of a yabium mm -hmm. form. So it's Paul in Lamo in union with her, with a consort. And it's also, it's a black tanka, uh, meaning that it's all, the, the form is arising out of, one could argue, the that infinite potentiality that has, you know, is beyond color, form, or shape. Uh, so in this context, just for those who are interested, because it is very, very interesting, is that this is the, um, this, form of Paul and Lamo and Yabyum is a is a karma cardu protector. So rather than mm -hmm. the form that we more typically associate with Paul and Lamo of the Galukpa tradition, uh, it's in the form of this uh Rangjong Gyalmo, which is the uh, this would be the self-arising uh, queen and originates from a vision of the second Karmapa, Karma Pakshi, who lived in the 13th century. And the composition uh meaning mother protector face to face. And it's unusual in that it depicts the male deity, Dorji uh, Benakchen, seated in Yam Yabyum upon the lap of the female protector, mm -hmm. uh, the great black cloaked. Uh, it's a dwarf form of Mahakala. Very interesting. Mm. He wears nine robes of black silk and wields a curved knife and skull cup of blood in his right mm -hmm. and left hands. And... Uh, Rangyan Gyalmo rides upon her blue iron mule above a sun disk, yeah, a holding a kadvanga trident, so this sort of uh, trident uh, staff, and a, and a triangular dagger or purba in her two right hands, and a mirror or serpent noose in her two mm -hmm. left hands. The top center is Vajradhara with Dombi Haruka, one of the, the, the Mahasiddhas, then Marpa on the right, and Karma Pakshi on the lower left, and the Karmapa. Mikyu Dorji in the lower right. In the top corner is a Vajavarahi, who we've been speaking about mm. as the the uh, her terrestrial body of Vajavarahi. She's the central, of course, tantric goddess, if you will, or meditational deity connected with the Tumul practices and also with the hidden lands. Mm. Um, and below her is another is another four-armed Mahakala, the top right corner, four-armed Avalukiteshvara and Yabyum, the Bodhisattva of Compassion. So it goes on with all these, yeah, these extraordinary yes. uh, retinue of deities and bodhisattvas and uh, a very, very elaborate vision, obviously. And so fascinating. It just ends with, uh, you know, the, both of these are mounted upon horses. Uh, and again, the black Naga king. So the, again, the Nagas, these serpentine deities of the nether world and of the the, fun, the psyche uh, mounted upon an elephant in this case, and the Kargyu mm -hmm. protector goddess Tashi Tsaringma would be the auspicious long life goddess riding upon a lion. So, really mm. quite a wonderful image. So, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, it, yeah, it, this is the Vajra world, obviously, mm -hmm. which is full of this, you know, you know magic and mystery. And... Very 
You talk into the people at home yeah. can't hear you. So it's the it's uh, you know Paul Dan Lamo, and then she has her consort face to face with her, as opposed to the usual way that we see um, union. Yeah. Right. So it's usually the male deity kind of seated with the consort facing. Well, him. although if if you work with Kala Chakra, okay, and some of the other tantras, but in the Kala Chakra, especially in the speech mandala. The, the female deities are larger than the male deities mm -hmm. and the male deities do sit on top. Okay. So it's okay. not, it's not, it's not that uh, okay. unusual, but um, I still love it. And yeah, they, the, the, on the mule, Bob, <laughs> Bob corrected a woman that um, I actually told a woman when we were going to Norbalinka mm -hmm. and she said uh, she wanted to get, uh, you know, one of the women that was traveling with, she wanted to get a tanka. And I said, oh, I really feel like, you, 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 Paul de Lama, because we're going to see the Dalai Lama. And then she came back and she said, I don't know if I found that, but I found this great one with riding a horse mm -hmm. and I love horses. And then it was Paul de Lama. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, and, and then Bob said, it's not a horse, it's a it's mule. A mule. <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, oh, but, but anyway, she got the right one, even without knowing, without knowing because that. she was attracted. Perfect, perfect. So, yeah, it yeah. was all perfect. Hey, Dr. Yeah, so Ian. it's just, you know, it's thank you for sharing it. And as you say, all of these deities, they can, they manifest according to the visions of great masters who will see into different aspects of that divine form that bring out a new dimension of that form. And so that they're, and then sharing the practices connected to that brings us into a more nuanced relationship with those with those uh, tantric deities mm. and as just to give an example of that it was very interesting once uh, i happened to be with tinley norbu uh tuku tinley norbu if anybody knows who that was he was the son of uh, duja rinpoche mm. who was once the the you know the head of the nyingma tradition but dungsi tinley norbu was a great uh, master and i happened to be sitting with him one-on-one -on -one once in his place in Kathmandu when one of his students brought in a tonka painting, a scroll painting that they'd had commissioned by a painter in uh, in Bodhanath, near where we were. And he was showing it to, to Tilly Norbu and saying, oh, I think the painter made the arm wrong. It's holding this rather than that. And I remember Tilly Norbu Mshe just yelling at him, said, do you think deities are dead? You think they can't change their posture? You think that just because it's this way, this way, it's not this way, that way? Yes. It was a very interesting, powerful That's teaching really to show great. that the iconography is, should not be seen as static yes. and fixed yeah. and uh, rigid. And here was one of the great, great Nyingma masters kind of lambasting a student for having this kind of rigid concept of iconography. Well, the orthodoxy, the orthodoxy. In, in everything, isn't it? Yeah. And like, yeah, so this is, yeah, so that's about bringing so out, powerful. Thinking, you know, things can change, which is, yeah. of course, the wow. more teaching in Buddhism. So, yeah. Hi, thanks. I have a question. I'm wondering if the Bon people uh, will embrace Padma Sambhava in their heart, as you mentioned, or is there like, will, will they not maybe do that? Will they not pray to Padma Sambhava? Huh. Well, a very interesting question, isn't it? Uh, when we look at the complex role of, you know, I mean, everybody here is familiar with Bun. No, tradition. will you explain? Okay. There's okay. some people coming in from the Hatha Yoga right, side, right, right. and we've okay. just started. So. so so in extremely simplistic terms, I, I will contextualize your question by saying that we talked about Padmasambhava or Guru Padmasambhava, the, the lotus-born master who was considered one of the great Mahasiddhas or realized adepts of the Tantric Buddhist tradition who brought Tantric Buddhism to Tibet in the 8th century um, and established it uh, at the invitation of Trisong Detsin, who was the emperor king of Tibet at that time. Uh, including the transmission of the so-called uh, Dzogchen or Great Perfection teachings, uh, or Ati Yoga, as they're also the Supreme Yoga, as it's also called. Uh, and there are many interesting uh, stories uh, connected with the coming of Padmasambhava, uh, who was considered in part a threat to a pre-existing spiritual transmission in Tibet called Bun, uh, which is, according to His Holiness the Dalai Lama, refers to it as the fifth sect of Tibetan Buddhism, because one can argue that 
Bun has many, it has so much in common with uh, other forms of Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, it's almost like a primordial form. And they, of course, say that they did have, through their own transmission of Bun, a, a, also the teachings of the Great Perfection, which according to the Buddhist tradition was brought to Tibet by Thomas Mab in the 8th century. But the Bun tradition will say, no, it, it, it existed for thousands of years earlier in our tradition through the oral transmission of Shangshun, as it was called, which is the Bun uh, kind of empire, if you will, in, in Western Tibet. Um, so there has been a historical conflicts between the Bun presentation of the highest and supreme yoga of Ati Yoga or Dzogchen and the Buddhist presentation in Tibet of Ati Yoga. And so the question really is about will the Bun tradition, which sees itself as uh, the Buddhists having kind of laid claim to practices that antedate uh, Padmasambhava's arrival uh, in Tibet. So how will they, they view that? And I, that's a complicated question, I think. But if you, you know, talk to the, the highest hierarchs of the Bun tradition, like Tenzin Namdak, who is still alive in Nepal, you know, I think they, he would answer it probably in a very skillful way that mm -hmm. there is no conflict. These were all great mm -hmm. masters, and these traditions interacted in so many productive ways. Sometimes, actually, you go to Bun texts, and because they were more open in the transmission of Dzogchen, Sometimes you get a better explanation of some of the more advanced practices mm -hmm. as they're presented in the Buddhist version. So the real practice is something where we can draw, if we think of the supreme yoga, Vati yoga, as it's presented in Bun and Buddhism, you know, we can draw from both traditions richly. Mm -hmm. And if we really want to look at how rich that is, we should read the Shiva Sutras of Kashmiri mm -hmm. Shaivism, because in fact, it's pretty undoubted that that was a direct influence on the Mm -hmm. development of the Dzogchen or Great Perfection teachings, both in Bun and, and in Buddhism. And we can go back before that and look at the teachings of the great female Mahasiddha Lakshmankara in her presentation of Sahaja, which is the great innate perfection of our being, which was already from that earliest time of 8th century, she should actually in some iterations would have been the half-sister of Padmasambhava because she was the, well, she was the, the sister of uh, she, uh, of um, Indrabhuti, who was the adoptive mm -hmm. father of Padmasambhava, but she was already teaching a really Dzogchen-like teaching that was already rejecting a lot of the ritual practices of Vajrayana at that time. And that was a period in history where we know that Tantric Shaivism mm -hmm. and Tantric Buddhism were deeply interacting yeah. within this land of Udhyana, mm -hmm. which was in a certain sense the prototype for all the other mm -hmm. hidden lands. So there and now in the in the valleys of uh, the Hindu Kush in what's now Pakistan. So I think the question is that really great masters would never see conflict. They would only see that all these traditions have built upon each other and interacted deeply and profoundly. And wouldn't they see that all, all beings are in their heart? Not one would be removed. <laughs> Hello, Hello, Tenzin. Hi.